Hello, this is Lewis from Then and Now. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different today, this week. I'm still going to do two videos this week. The next one uh, will be coming up towards the end of the week. But I just wanted to make a video, and I haven't done this before, so I'm a little bit nervous. I've never had my face on screen before. Um, I've never thought there to be any need doing the sort of videos I do, but, and also this may go down, uh, it may go down well, it may not, and if it doesn't, I probably won't do another one, and I might not have enough subscribers to get any kind of response um, in the way I'd like. Nevertheless, the reason I'm doing this video is to ask for some feedback and I've been making videos on then and now um, for a couple of years now on and off um, and I'm now committed to trying to make something of it full time and I'm going to be making a video every week or so for the foreseeable future um, and I was hoping if anyone bored enough to be watching this right now, who has watched my videos, whether they've watched all of them or just some of them or just one of them. If you have any feedback, if you have any criticism, if you have any ideas, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. I'm looking to try and work out the direction that the channel's going to be going in because it, I'm not sure where I want to take it and I'm not sure whether there is an overriding theme or there should be and to me the theme is the humanities and it always will be loosely the humanities generally history politics philosophy and you know I'll delve in and out of of, of those subjects as is necessary while bringing in literature, science, contemporary events, whatever, um, whatever's needed at the time. And my main question is, do you think that's a coherent direction for the channel? Do you watch every week and get something that you expect? Or do you watch some weeks and think, this is a little off topic or I don't really understand what this channel's about. Um, I wish he'd just stick to this or I wish he'd do more of this. That's the sort of things I want to get feedback about. Because one of the things is every video I make gets around the same response from my subscriber count which is about a 10% uh, view rate whatever that subscriber count is at the time and then about 10% of those who watch will like the video and some do better than others but from that it's very hard to judge what people like and what people don't and my most popular videos are the videos, the introductory videos on philosophers or theories. And they get the same amount of views at the beginning, but then either the way they're indexed in the algorithm or the, those subjects get searched for more on YouTube, they tend to get a lot more searches, views after the fact, after they settled into the, um, into the search results on YouTube. So, it's hard to tell, again, whether they're popular because they're better than the other ones I do or just because they're popular because that's what people are searching for on YouTube. And I will continue to do those videos. I like making them. Um, I think that is what I'm roughly good at. Um, but they're not my favourites to make. My favourites are the ones where I try and take some sort of time slice, holistic theme, topic, period, and then try and draw some three-dimensional picture around that that brings in a bit of history, a bit of politics, a bit of philosophy. Um, 
And so I will continue. The ones I'm talking about are ones like the one on, for example, 1816, uh, the eruption of Mount Tambora. I like that. Or the Spanish Civil War um, and literature. I like taking a, a, an event or a popular uh, subject or idea, book, war, whatever, and then trying to look at it from a different angle and trying to bring in some philosophy and trying to bring in some, you know, try and answer the question of what that tells us about what it is to be human. And then what we can learn from that today, which is something I've been told I should do more of. I should try and maybe tie in uh, contemporary events a bit more and try and bring them up today. And I think I've done that, if you've seen it in my most recent video uh, on post-war Europe. I don't, I don't think the, the public discourse reflects well enough historical events and how we can learn from them. Um, and I think it's always important to do that. So that one is very much told from a perspective of, well, what do we need to look at today in the past, um, rather than just randomly delving into the past. Um, and as well as subjects and the, the uh, topic of the video, again, if you have time, I'm just looking for some feedback on what you think works, what doesn't, um, what you think I need to improve on, what you think uh, I should maybe focus more on. For example, I was told over and over again the music's too loud and it's distracting, so I've really tried to limit the music um, and I've turned it right down and that was great advice. So anything like that, any feedback about style, do you like the... Do you like the um, the, the historical footage or do you more like the sort of simple uh, graphical bits that try and you know illustrate a, a, a theory or an idea or do you like the mixture of both um, do you like the lengths of the videos do you prefer the shorter ones do you prefer the longer ones um, just any advice criticism any questions you have it would be hugely appreciated and I will take it all into consideration. Um, so that was part one of this and I'm going to try not to ramble on for too long. Second uh, is just very briefly thank you to everyone who watches and everyone that likes and shares and subscribes and uh, likes and retweets on Twitter and likes and shares on Facebook. Um, anyone that shares links on Reddit, all of that. At this stage, when I have so few followers, every single one of those interactions with the channel makes such a massive difference and it's hugely appreciated and it really helps the channel grow. Um, and... Uh, and I'm not going to talk about this because I read too much anyway because I, I do talk about it at the end of every video but huge, huge thank you to everyone that supports me on Patreon um, that is the only way I can do this at the moment um, that is my only income the the ad revenue that you, you get from uh, YouTube is so minimal that you need to be you, you need to have hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of followers subscribers before it makes any difference so anyone that supports me on patreon where you can just pledge as little as a dollar towards each video and you can limit that to a dollar a month if you like um, it's just an amazing way to give people a footing trying to you know do something independently um, and especially thanks to um, Owen Pitcairn and Robert Moore who have who they've 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 pledged so much and over the six the last six months they've given me so much in financial support that I probably wouldn't be able to do it uh, without them um oh they've at least been a huge contribution so if by any chance either of you two are watching this thank you so much and third uh, the, the, the second to last 
video I made, um, the one before last even, on the Shawshank Redemption. It was one of my favourite videos to make, and it's one, it is, it's one of my favourite films, and it was, I'm, I was really proud of it, and it was, it was of, of substantial length, it was 24 minutes long, and I thought it all fit together really well. Um, and sadly, as soon as I uploaded it, uploaded it, it got hit with a copyright claim from Warner Brothers, which means it gets blocked, um, and then you can, um, you can, uh, that there, there was a bit of back and forth with Warner Brothers, and they say that you can, um, in the end, that I could, the video could be viewed, uh, but they'd be keeping the revenue from the ads, which was expected. That's not a problem. But for some reason, after that first week where it was blocked, uh, and then it was unblocked, and it sort of re-entered the the YouTube ecosystem. For some reason, the algorithm then didn't look on it very favourably. Um, or it just slipped in without being um, um, without subscribers being alerted to it being uploaded so it, it didn't have anywhere near as many views um, as my other videos do which I was really disappointed with because it is one of my favourites so if you haven't seen it uh, one before last uh, the philosophy of hope and stoicism in the Shawshank Redemption um, and why Hope is a fundamental part of our psychology and our consciousness. Go and watch it if you haven't. And then finally, this is a bit of a ramble, I know, I'm sorry. Um, I, I might do a little bit more of this, depending on how, how well, you know, I'm going to do it a few times over the, ne over the course of the next year, depending on how well it goes down depending on how well I think I do and whether I enjoy it or not or whether I think it's a complete mess. I might do more of it just because A, it's, it's, three, it's free therapy. I can just sit here and ramble. But, you know, it's not really like talking to yourself because there is obviously someone hopefully watching or you at least perceive someone to be watching. It's a funny thing, I was thinking about this. Um, it's not as if, you are, you're talking to no one, but it's not the same as just, as you know, walking around your house, mumbling to yourself, because there is a perceived someone, but it's no one in particular. It's not like talking to a friend, you don't have, um, you don't have someone in mind to project your thoughts towards, um, that you know, and that you know you know what they like and you know your sort of sense of humours and you know your sort of repertoire and your interests and your back and forth and your rhythms and all that. And, you know, obviously everything you say is is considered um, with all that in mind. With this, it's an odd thing because even though there might potentially be someone watching, you'd have no idea. You, there's, no, there's no idea of a person to project your... Uh, the content of what you're saying towards so you really are only talking to a sort of idealized version of yourself the ego ideal or the ideal ego I can't I can't ever remember which way around it is so it's an odd thing but it's I'd, I I I do I think I quite like it and I, I suppose you just get better at it and what I might do is just slowly introduce videos talking about what is going to be coming up in videos, what I'm reading at the moment, what I'm thinking about reading, what I'm working on, what I'd like to be reading, and maybe talk briefly in a kind of semi-informal book review way about the things I've been reading. Um, I don't know, and just see how that goes. It might be the most boring thing anyone's ever witnessed. But you never know people do watch odd things so maybe we'll see i'm you know for uh, for example at the moment i've been reading um this would be a good thing to get some uh, some additional feedback and some sort of back and forth on before i actually commit to making a video so for example i've been reading um uh i've just finished reading primo levy's 
if this is a man, it's a count of the Holocaust, of his time in Auschwitz. Um, and it is, it's a really dark and disturbing uh, but profound book. And it, it's, it's a difficult read in many, in many ways, but if you're interested in the 20th century in, in any way, then I think it's a it's a it's just it's a necessary book, um, which I think is what Philip Roth says about it on the blurb. It's truly one of the twentieth century's most necessary reads. So the necessary reads aren't always the uh, most easy reads, but in it he talks about the the idea of being at the bottom of life, the very bottom you know, where you're literally clinging on uh, to life and every step is a step away from death and what's, what that's like and what that does to the human spirit and, and, and how that influences your decisions and how every minor decision you make um, up to, you know, the sort of second, which second you choose to jump into the food queue and who you talk to and how you can serve every every sort of every ounce of your energy and how if you if any one of those decisions you um you make wrong it could lead to your demise and it's it's that it's such an odd experience to read it and he he talks about the idea of the noble savage Rousseau's idea you know that deep down everyone's good but it's modern society um, that corrupts us and it's an idea that's taken up you know it still holds some currency today but it was taken up um, by the left uh, for a large part of the, the the 19th century at least and um, he says oh, this is this is this is bullshit when it comes down to it and, you know, Auschwitz is a really important test case for this side of this type of idea. And he says, when it comes down to it, there is no nobility, there's no nobility in, in Auschwitz. There's no, you do what you can to survive. You don't consider anything else. And obviously there are some moments of, of um, camaraderie and, and altruism and doing good, of course. But he says, it's not an intrinsic part of human nature. Survival is the, the intrinsic part of human nature, if anything. And I thought that would make an interesting take on that book because, um, and I could look, you know, use that book as part of a larger narrative on the history of the noble savage and different ways it's been used and how it's sort of, you know, how it evolved into or how it evolved out of maybe the blank slate, Locke, Locke's idea of the blank slate and those, the interaction between those two ideas. But what I realise this is a difficult subject to make a video about. I'm not sure what I could add to it. I'm not sure how I'd pull it off logistically. Not sure. Uh, and <clears throat> again, another one, A Dark Continent is a great book I've been reading by Mark Mazzaua. It's really what, probably the book to read on the 20th century experience and the, um, um, and it, it, it takes a really, it has a great perspective on the 20th century and it's sort of, look how contingent the, I, the, the victory of liberalism or democracy or, you know, the way we see the world now in the West has been and how close a battle it's been to so many different ideas that held so much currency for so long and, and so many people fought for um, and it was never as clear as sort of the battle of good versus evil that we see it as this inevitable battle that was going to lead to good triumphing as we we uh, frequently see it as um, that's a great book again I was going to make a video about that um, but then I thought it's just it would just be a it would just be a complete rip-off of the book, really, and I wouldn't be bringing anything new to it. And I'm not sure if it's ethical to do that for a start, or if it'd be interesting. Or, I mean, I could, you could, I could do a review of the book, I suppose. And but I think 
more likely as it came to the end of reading it, what I'd do is I'm going to now read uh, Eric Hobsbawm's account of the 20th century, The Age of Extremes. Um, and I've been reading um, Tony Jutt's post war 1945, which obviously influenced the last video. But I think what's more likely is that I'll read a few different things and then synthesize them into a video um, in some way, rather than just doing it about one book. I think that only really works for the sort of philosopher or the theory videos. Um, yeah. I don't think I'll say much more. I think I'll just say that uh, the next video I'll be doing is one on neuropolitics, which I'm still reading around, which, you know, the idea of whether we can scan with fMRI scanners the brains of a, of a conservative and a liberal and to uh, make distinctions and see what makes them tick and why they think like that, or whether we don't really learn anything from that at all, and what the dangers are and what the um, and why neuroscience seems so exciting, but maybe isn't quite as as um, as enlightening as popular culture and the press and media makes it out to be. Um, so that's coming up and after that I'm going to be making a video on I came across this great little um, documentary the, it was the first documentary by Errol Morris who made The Thin Blue Line um, great documentarium and it was on um, it was on a, it was in a Vice article about the 10 most intellectual documentaries on Netflix. I'll maybe put a link in the bio, in the description. Um, anyway, it was, it was about a pet cemetery and there was no, that, no narrator, just an hour and 20 minutes of people talking about their dead pets and it was, it was done in such a captivating way. Um, and there's quite an interesting story behind it and I'm just going to sort of ask the question of philosophically what makes it, the film itself so captivating and what also makes people so upset and attached to their pets philosophically I think there might be something interesting to get out there although I haven't really read much around it yet um and I think I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for watching. I'm sorry you've had to endure this. But please, if you do have a few minutes, help me um, sort of gather my thoughts and give me some feedback and help me try and make the channel better. And um, yeah, I'd like to make this a collaborative effort. Um, I want to take it in the direction um, my subscribers want to see it taken in um, and yeah I just feel very lucky to be able to do this at the moment it's great fun um, so thank you see you next week if you want to support then and now then please subscribe below and most importantly click the bell here to receive notifications when I upload a new video. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram in the links in the description below and if you're feeling really generous then this channel only exists through the support of pledges on Patreon where you can support new content with as little as a dollar for each new video. Thanks for watching, see you next week.